But anyway, that's, that's, um, that's what we're hoping to do is to go and to share the gospel in Poland. But when we're looking, looking at that and we're having a plan and putting all that all together, we are wanting to know that we're, we're going in the right way and that we're planning and working for the right thing. But that, that leads us to the question, what is the key to success as a missionary, when we're looking at our goal and we're looking at how to achieve it, how can we do that? What's the key that we need? But before you can even answer that question, you have to answer the next question, which is, what is success for a missionary? How can you measure success? Is it the uh, most sermons preached? You're trying to share the gospel with as many people as you can. Is it the most churches planted? I mean, surely that's what we're going for. Is it just the most people saved? I mean, that's what we want to see. We want to see people trusting in Christ and having their lives changed. Now, if missions were our work, you might be able to argue for something like that, one of those metrics. But if you look at the Bible, you'll find that missions is not our work, but God's work. And the first passage I want to turn to is Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, 36 through 38. If the the screen works, we should be able to have some of those up on the screen, but you're also welcome to turn to it yourself. So Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 36. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. And the passage might be very familiar Uh, to us. And so we might miss this emphasis, but I think it's important to notice where the passage itself puts the emphasis. First, who was it that felt compassion? It was Jesus. He was the one who saw the need and acknowledged it first. And then secondly, who's supposed to fulfill the need? In one sense, it's the disciples because they're supposed to pray. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, the need is great, therefore go. Or even, the need is great, therefore tell other people to go. But he says, the need is great. And those are good applications of that. But the passage itself puts the emphasis on the Lord. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest, pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. He's the one who has the burden for it. He's the one who's filling it, fulfilling it by sending out the labors. And it's ultimately his harvest. He's the one who is, who is Lord over that harvest. So the passage is putting the, the emphasis on the Lord entirely. It's not about what we can do. The focus is not on me. But it's about God accomplishing his work. Next passage I want to look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 starting in verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And then again, just a couple things to note. First, it's God who causes the growth. Not the one who plants, not the one who waters, but it's God who causes the growth. And now obviously the person who's planting, the person who's watering, they're involved and they're working And there in verse 9, it says, we are laborers together with God. But it is God who is accomplishing the work. It's God who's doing it. 
and the people who are working, each laborer will receive his own reward, but it's not according to the fruits. Normally, if you plant a harvest, when you reap the benefit of that, it's according to whatever harvest grows. But he's saying it's not about that. It's you'll reap your reward according to your labor, your faithful, obedient service. And the results ultimately are up to God. So God doesn't need Tim and Claire to go into Poland if he wants to sweep through Poland with revival. He doesn't need us. He could, he could send out 12 legions of angels to proclaim the gospel throughout the whole world at one time. And they would never need to go through deputation or practice, go through language study and learn the culture, all those things. They could do it immediately with no barriers. He could call out from the sky like he did for the Apostle Paul. But that's not how he's typically chosen to work. He's used angels to proclaim a message when Jesus was born. He's called out to the Apostle Paul directly. So he can do those things. But he's chosen to do it through us, to accomplish his will to see people saved. If you think of it a little bit like a family and a father with, with two kids and he wants to build a swing set for them. And now he could go and he could build it himself, but he wants to get the, the kids involved to do it with them. And so he says, okay, guys, let's, let's go um, get in the truck, and we're going to go and buy the materials, what we need. And so they drive to the hardware store, get all the lumber and screws and everything, bring it back home, and then he gives them different roles. He assigns, okay, maybe there's an eight-year-old. He says, okay, can you measure out the boards and mark them? And then I'll come help you cut them. And then once they're cut, he gets his four-year-old to be involved. And he says, okay, he holds the boards together and says, okay, we're going we're gonna to put a screw in right here. And he, like, guides his hand. And he's, he's working with them to accomplish building this swing set. And he's not frustrated and looking at them and like, oh, my word, these guys are so slow. Should have just done this myself or hired that handyman contractor who contacted me, left his thing on hanger on my door. That's, that's not his feeling. He's not frustrated by that. He wants for them to be involved. It's his joy to be laboring together with them, for them to be laboring together with him to accomplish this. It's not that God has these great blueprints, this great mission, but he needs us to accomplish it. He can do it without us, and ultimately he will do it but he wants us to be involved. And that brings him greater glory through that. So God has this great mission. In 1 Timothy we read, God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. God has a desire to see people saved. God has a great mission. And he's chosen to accomplish it through humans. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, just the um, next chapter over, tr uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we can read, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Again, so let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now this applies certainly to people who are involved in full-time ministry and proclaiming the gospel from the pulpit or wherever. But if you are a believer and if you have come to understand the gospel, that mystery of God, you too are a steward of the mysteries of God. This is not just for um, full-time people in Christian service. This is for every believer. And he says there at the end, moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If you have accepted Christ, you are a steward of these mysteries and it's required of you that you be found faithful. But what does faithfulness look like? We're required to be faithful. What does this look like? Well, you could spend weeks in a Bible study just studying faithfulness. 
And I'm not going to try to attempt to cover everything about the Bible says about faithfulness, but I want to highlight two aspects. First, it's that faithfulness looks different for different stewards. And now there are certain things that everybody is supposed to be doing. Uh, everybody's supposed to be developing the fruits of the Spirit, to be growing in Christ-likeness, all of that. But different people do have different roles in the body of Christ. If all if everyone were an eye, where would the hearing be? We have different roles as part of this. Not everyone is called to spend a significant time every week studying a new language so that they can better share the gospel. But if you have a missionary and they neglect studying the language, they're not going to be able to minister as effectively in the country. Faithfulness for you may involve overcoming a fear of rejection so that you can talk to your coworker about the gospel. It may taking some time to specifically minister to a family member who's struggling and maybe they're not a believer and so you can share the gospel with them. Whatever your situation may be, if you're a teen, if you're an adult, if you're um, just a kid, it's, your, your role is going to be different and it's going to look different. And you, so you get my point. We all have different roles and so you can't necessarily measure faithfulness with one thing. You really have to be in tune prayerfully to God, um, listening to the Holy Spirit to help discern what faithfulness will look like for you. And second point is that faithfulness is all-encompassing. It impacts every area of your life. When we are born again, our entire purpose for living changes. In Philippians 3, we can read, our citizenship is in heaven. Your reason for living is fundamentally different than those around you. It's not like that you can just tack faithfulness on the side. It's faithfulness is not a side hustle that you can add in in your spare time. You've got all your daily activities, and you've got everything that you have to do in life, and then when you get a chance to share the gospel or when you have the opportunity for, you know, to be obedient and faithful, then you try to fit that in where it goes. That's not what faithfulness look, looks like. It's, it's a whole change of our mindset. Paul writes, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what are you treasuring? What are you looking towards? What are you seeking first? Is it the kingdom of heaven? Are you being faithful in that? Now, if you are living in this world, and if you are here today, you are still living in this world, likely means that you will own a house or live in an apartment or have a phone or drive a car. It likely means one or more of those things. It may even be a nice apartment or a nice house a nice car, a nice phone, because God delights in giving good gifts to his children. But if your goal is to have a nice phone, a nice car, a nice house, that's what you're, that's what you're treasuring, then that's where your heart will be also. If you've ever said, I could never, that might be a sign of where your treasure is. I could never share the gospel with my coworker or my friends because what if they don't want to talk with me anymore? What if that puts up a barrier and they don't want to hang out with me? Are you treasuring your, fr your, your, your friendship with those people more than obedience to Christ? Or what if you say um, what you're afraid of? I'm afraid to share the gospel because just... What if that makes people not like me? I could never work at a place, a uh, Christian organization, because they, they wouldn't pay me what I need to 
or, you know, wouldn't pay me what I want to really have a comfortable life. I'm afraid to ask my boss for Sundays off because what if, what if I, he doesn't give me that promotion that I'm looking forward to? Or what if he even fires me if I ask for Sundays off? What if he lets me go? Are you treasuring your God and, and, and doubting God's provision more than our responsibility to gather with other Christians, believers? Those are things that you will have to answer for yourself. You have to pray to God and look towards how He is leading you. So what does this mean for you? We said it's different. Faithfulness is different for different people. So I'm not necessarily going to say this is what you need to do in your situation and this and this, but we need to be sensitive to God's leading through His Holy Spirit. We want to be laying up our treasures in heaven. We want to value what God values. And it's clear that God has a burden for the lost. He has a desire to see people saved. Are we also desiring that? Are we also trying to make that a priority and an emphasis? Are we faithfully serving through praying, through giving, through going, whether that's across the world or across the street. If you are a human, you most certainly will not be perfectly faithful in any of those things. But we can pray to God that he will help us be more faithful. And then we will fail to be faithful in praying to God to help us be faithful. And so we come back to him and ask him for forgiveness and help. But it's a constant reminder that we can never achieve faithfulness or ever achieve perfection in the Christian life. And God's designed it that way so that we always have to come back to him asking for help, asking for mercy and forgiveness. We can never get to a point where we can check off the box and say, okay, I'm faithful, I've got that accomplished, and I can move on to other things. We're never going to be there. So it's a constant coming back to God and asking Him for His help and for His grace and forgiveness so that we can be more faithful, and we can strive after those heavenly treasures that we're supposed to be seeking. So if we circle back to the beginning, we come again to the question, what is success for a missionary? We see that it's not numbers, but instead it's what we've been talking about, faithfulness to the calling, what we've been called to. It's no different than any Christian. Faithfulness, faithful obedience to God's calling, whatever that is for your life. When facing the end of his life, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. He didn't look back and reflect on all the people who had come to know Christ through him, all the results of his labor, the churches that had been planted, the gospel that's been presented and proclaimed, he didn't look back on that and say, that is how I know God has used me. That's how I know I've been um, successful in my ministry. That's not what he looked at. He looked at how he had served, how he had run the race, how he had fought the good fight, how he had finished his course, he had kept the faith. He's looking back and, and taking comfort in the fact that he had been faithful. And he knew that he had not been perfectly faithful. He said he was the chief of sinners. But he knew that he had served God and he was glad in that. Not in all the things that God had done but he was glad that he had served and obviously rejoicing that God had done these great things, but that was not what he was putting his hope in. And so this is very humbling for us because we look at this and we can know that we'll never be able to accomplish this. We'll never get to a point where we can 
B, we've been faithful and we're good. We're done. Check off faithfulness. We've got it. Move on to something else. We know that they will never get there. And we need to constantly be coming, to, coming back to God. And it's just a constant reminder of God's grace and God's faithfulness to us and his forgiveness. But then again, in a re- very real sense, it is very freeing. When we look at the great need in Poland, in Yonkers, in New York City, throughout the globe, and we look at that and we're like, there's no way we can accomplish this. There's no way we can be faithful enough and, and good enough to be able to see all these people saved. But it's so freeing to remember that missions is first of all God's burden. And though we will fail and we will fall short and we have to come back to God, we will fail but we know that God will not fail. He will not fail to accomplish His burden to see people saved. Though we will not be perfectly faithful and we're striving after that, God will be perfectly faithful. And so nothing I can do will mess up his plan. Satan can fight and Satan can oppose, but he cannot mess up God's plan. We see that through the cross. We see that through the testimony of Job. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his will. So it's very humbling, a reminder of our need for God's grace, but it's very freeing knowing that God will accomplish His great mission. And our prayer, my prayer, and your prayer is that we can be faithful servants following God in obedience to whatever He has called us to do. So let's pray and let's look to God asking for help to accomplish that. This week, this month, next month, in the coming year. Help us to be more faithful and help us to be sensitive to what he has called us to do so that we can be obedient to his calling. So let's pray for that now. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray that you will help all of us here to be faithful fellow laborers with you in accomplishing your will to see people saved across the globe and to see your church grow and mature. Help us to love you and to set our treasures on things above and that we would seek first the kingdom of heaven. Help us all here in our weakness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.